All right, switch me back. Well, hello, everybody. David Gross with Condi Systems back with you today to share a little bit of my secrets for sublimation success. Today is a question and answer uh, live, and uh, we're so glad you're with us. Um, happy Friday for those that are watching live. And um, got a lot of questions, I must say, and th it's a lot of fun. This is what I, I love to do. It's sort of like um, being on Final Jeopardy and answering those questions. So you can submit questions either on YouTube or Facebook, and hopefully they'll re get relayed to me. And uh, so let's go ahead and begin. A couple of housekeeping issues is usually every Wednesday around here we'll have some sort of education Wednesday, some sort of guest, and for this coming Wednesday, we've got a, um, a good friend of Condi's Caligaz Photo, which is uh, in Mobile here. They are a very uh, multi-generational photo business that, of course, made the transition from um, film to um, other types of businesses, and they're going to share with us some of their great ideas. And then I believe the um, week after that, on Wednesday, we'll have Sherry Kuch Cheryl Kuchek with us to talk about um, cutting your own uh, products using a laser, uh, mainly hardboard, things like that, become very popular, I might add. So with that, uh, please submit questions. We'll get to them if we run out of time. Then uh, we'll figure out a way to let you know the answer. Um, had a couple of questions that um, were um, were repeated over and over again. The first one is related to press lines when you're pressing onto fabrics, and uh, basically, you know, when you press your your transfer onto polyester fabric, the edge of the transfer can often leave a permanent press crease mark, and um, pretty easy solutions to it so let's walk you through that process first is be aware that you really need um, the vapor foam kit uh, the vapor foam kit is a big roll of squishy foam and what we want to do with that foam uh, here's a piece from uh, our print services um, I took it directly out of our print services so I know they're going to be missing it a little bit um, so I'll return it but at any rate uh, what this is used for is to place on, on the bottom of your heat press and um, it needs to be cut so that it is um, smaller than the transfer paper okay, and larger than the image area on the paper. So, so those are two requirements and the, the goal here is that when you press down the edge of the paper, pretend like um, this is the edge of the paper, the edge of the paper um, floats. In other words, the edge of the paper never touches anything. Um, and that, of course, would prevent a crease. Now, if you do those two steps correctly, but you use too much pressure um, and squash the foam, then you haven't really accomplished anything. Um, so um, you need to need to you know use the kind of pressure that has good contact, but you're not squashing the foam. And how do you do that? Well, if you've got a uh, press like I have back here, the DK20S, then it actually turns out to be um, you know fairly easy because you can get down to the press at eye level. Um, you know, I could get down here and and I could see. Um, when I'm closing the press, um, you know, that, that things are okay. Now, the this press behind me um, has a very heavy platen. And so one of the tricks to, to doing uh, this kind of thing, actually pretty easy, is to adjust the pressure so that it's so tight you can't close the press but you can certainly lower the platen and let the weight of the platen be your pressure and very often that's that's sufficient um, pressure but uh but a more precise way would be to adjust the black knob 
with the press lowered um, so that you start backing it off so that it, it starts to lock making good contact with the vapor foam kit. I think one of the challenges for people is you get yourself dialed in and then you have to remember say next week you know your, your dial in settings you know what you did but it really isn't very hard because you can get to eye level and and see where your pressure is so those are the basic steps um, in, in doing a um, uh, doing a shirt um, the other part of tuning that process is to do what I call decal the edge deckling the edge um, means that instead of having a very sharp edge of the paper which would be like a paper cut you know kind of edge because paper is sharp um, you you tear the edge so that it's a irregular edge so it has it loses a lot of its sharpness but more importantly it loses its regular edge instead of being a sharp line that the eye can pick up on now it's a regular edge and it's very difficult to see it on a shirt even if you do crease it now as the fa as the fabric becomes extremely thin uh, crease marks are are even more difficult to to manage because the fabric is so so sheen and it's easy but um, we press gobs and gobs of shirts with no press lines using this exact technique and uh, very easy when the foam stops being foam and just something flat and you know with no cush to it throw it away make yourself a new piece um, and, and that's really it um, so if there are any other tunings that you want me to do on that um, certainly I got a question about Baron um, how's family how's Baron doing Baron is our um, probably 150 pound two-year-old uh, half St. Bernard half Newfoundland and um, he is enjoying himself um, plays in the pool every day and to the park and um, so uh, everything is good thank you for asking um, okay uh, moving on here had a question about um, calibrating the heat press and um, wanted to show you two ways to do it so um, this is um, what's called a digital pyrometer and it's basically a multimeter with a temperature probe um, we use these here at Condi uh, works very well basically you turn it on you hold the thing there and it's done and I'll turn it on now and just sort of see what's going on with this press here I know y'all really can't see it um, but at least I'll, I'll sort of know and um, it's going to give you a very precise reading very precise reading when it settles down so the press is showing it mm, about 380 and the display is at 397 so I'm going to try another another spot here 380 390 so you got stuff so at any rate at any any one time the press is going to be heating up or cooling down um, and but if you're if you're measuring it and you see enough of a difference what you can do is push the magic buttons at the front panel and that allows you to get into the calibration mode where essentially you're going to adjust and offset up or down depending on which way you need and do it. Now, um, the way I like to do it, and Aaron, of course, at, at the George Knight Company makes fun of my method here, but I really like it. So this is a very precise instrument at a precise spot. But what we're really after is a more average. And so this is, I bought it off eBay, I think, and it's maybe 7 or $12 or something. Um, it is a digital metal candy thermometer um, and you know use it in cooking things like that we're going to turn it on and um, and so what we're going to do is is you we're going to do an average so if I put it across here and just simply lower the platen down without really closing it um, so we're not trying to break 
the um, the um, instrument or anything. Uh, we're going to see exactly where we're going to be at, um, and um, it's uh, still climbing here. Um, so used to remember it climbed faster than this, but um, it's taking its time. But at any rate, it's it's in general. I find it to be very helpful um, with um, with with uh, calibrating heat presses um, because it's a it's it's very it's it's taking more of an average across the the uh, platen than this is. But this would be your we call it your gold standard. The the um, digital metal candy thermometer is is more of sort of a really easy thing and. It's remarkably right on 400 degrees, so um, just um, really good there. So good, good uh, average there. Um, um, another thing on a heat press I want to show you. <clears throat> what did I do with it? Is um, and I know you have a little bit of a challenge seeing it, but I think it's pretty easy. Got a video, and that is when we're pressing stuff, especially when we're pressing shirts. Um, we really want to ensure that the press is closing evenly. And this is one of the reasons why for sublimation it's much more appropriate to uh, have a swing away. Because swing away by definition is going to have um, even uh, level pressure. So I've taken a piece of paper and I've just cut it into fours. And what I'm going to do is place one piece of paper under each of the sides and then I'm going to lower it. Now this particular press has seen some some very heavy usage and um, as you use presses um, the, the mechanism itself is going to get a little bit shifted around. Just, just the nature of things that are made from nuts and bolts and stuff like that. But what we're going to do is we're going to lower the press and I'm not going to use any pressure. I'm just going to lower it just like that. So you know pretty much just just letting the platen mate with the bottom platen and then we go around here and pull these out well uh, on this particular press I can pull out the front um, easy so that means the front is not quite as closed or are making as good a contact as the back go through a process of just loosening these bolts and then with heavy pressure letting the mechanism um, uh, readjust so that um, it's hitting the bottom platen um, evenly. Very easy procedure to go through, but the bottom line is um, if you don't know to ever check this, well guess what? You're, you're going to beat your head against the wall trying to figure out why you're having trouble with getting consistent results across the entire um, uh, platen when you're using light pressure. So this is where it really comes into play is, is making sure the press is closing evenly under light pressure. Um, and then the last part of the press is, is taking care of your press. You know, you want your press to last a lifetime if not more and so be sure to understand what parts of your press you need to lubricate um, to ensure that that you're not going to destroy any of the metal components. I got a question about the um, Omex pad and working with slates. Um, okay, uh, Bo have, is helping me today. Thank you, Bo, for being here. Okay. A customer, they they burnt it. They didn't use it, and they burnt it. And they want to know if there's any way. They of um, the, this is the green pad where the Nomex pad is oh, different um, but you're referring to the green rubber yeah. pad so um, I'm not sure what you mean by burning it because these really are, are probably no, they, they burnt the substrate okay so if you burnt the substrate then probably you need to call tech support because there's something going on that that deserves a little attention but generally, why do we use a green pad? And we use a green pad so that we have really good heat conduction 
when when the level the the surface of the substrate plus the the levelness of the product needs a little bit of of cushion to ensure that that we're doing a great job with with making that paper um, hit the surface sublimation is a contact technology it's not a pressure technology we just need good even contact and so the 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 green rubber is our go-to method for ensuring that we're making good contact. With good contact across the surface, then the green pad helps us with getting good heat conduction into the surface. And so with slate, slate's one of those items that is not the right item to start off on because it is a little bit difficult to do because of the longer dwell time. Um, but certainly you want to look at my videos where I show you how to dial in a substrate by doing a black stripe. And so um, you, you just sort of, you just print a little transfer of just black, RGB000, and just press a black stripe, it could be an inch wide, and look and see where you're at. And then you keep, let it cool, keep doing that until you get your, your best black. Um, and that will, um, will, will, will dial it in. Then in your journal, you want to make sure you record your results so that you don't have to constantly do it again. Okay? Um, so uh, you got to just keep up with those questions, Bo, because there's a lot. Um, um, okay, um, another question was um, um, if I've got a, I think it's um, if your substrate in your design is bigger than your press, can you press with no lines? Um, and and so let me try to understand. So you're you've you've got a um, um, either either your pr printer can't print that big or your press. Um, your design is bigger than your press. Okay. So um, if you're trying to piece together transfers. Um, so that, that, you know, you print out multiple parts of your transfer and try to press them together, um, that's difficult to do. Um, because when you piece them together, you're likely to have, have a line, and that's just difficult to, um, to avoid. But if your design does not have a continuous background, then you can do it. Um, and so the, uh, some of the Oki software we use... Uh, um, I'm trying to remember the name. It breaks apart a design into to multiple prints, um, but it's easy to do. Um, if you've got a design with no background, you just print out different sections and you could press them. But if you've got a continuous background, um, there's just no easy way to do that. Sometimes on a soft substrate, you can get good enough and um, where, where a little bit of a line is is not very visible, but it's um, it's, it's still challenging. Um, hey David. Yeah. What if you happen to uh, get ink on your press? Yeah, I want to give you a mic here, and you can just um, talk, and people can hear what you're saying. Um, also, there, Bo. Bo, by the way, is um, comes from us from Caesar. He was one of their um, uh, support people there, so we're very fortunate to have him. Um, so, what's your question? Uh, if you get ink on your press, is there any way to remove it? Um, sure. Um, so, ink is not going to hurt a press. Um, so, if you've got ink on it, um, then you can let it cool, wipe it off with, say, denatured alcohol, and you should be good to go. Um, one of the things you want to do is make sure that when you're pressing, you always use cover paper on the bottom. Um, there are just a handful of substrates that we would want to use Teflon on the bottom. Um, and Teflon is, is um, sort of evil, so we do want to avoid using Teflon. It's, it's not a good thing um, because uh, Teflon on top is a moisture barrier. Moisture is a problem with sublimation, so we want to avoid that. Occasionally we need to use Teflon on the bottom, like with our sublimatable patches or substrates that have things that are going to stick, uh, like that. Um, so we got another question. 
about someone that has a printer that just does eight and a half by 14 and they need to print bigger. So it's sort of like that, that same question we did before. But one comment is that if you have um, one of these, say an SG400 or 500, and that's an eight and a half by 14 printer, you can buy the bypass tray, <clears throat> bypass tray and print longer. So for instance, we do have paper that is cut that is eight and a half by 21. So that would be especially valuable for folks that are doing socks with their their 400 or 500. So um, that um, that's good. Um, ask about something exposed to denatured alcohol. I don't remember. Oh, the, well, you um, were talking about cleaning the, uh, the platen. Yeah, yeah. Um, Was that denatured alcohol? It is. So in California, denatured alcohol, alcohol I believe, has been outlawed. So you would just need to have a, a high percent um, rubbing alcohol, uh, and that would also get the job. So, um, okay. We got, um, a, we got a question here. Does um, the type of paper matter when it comes to brightness on a garment? Um, you know, as far as sublimation paper, um, we use sublimation paper um, to try to keep the ink really on the surface as best we can so that it releases off the paper when it turns into to a gas. Um, and we have a, a handful of papers that work really well. Um, and also a paper is designed to keep the dots very sharp, like for photographs, especially on, on hard substrates. Some people will say, well, plain paper works for me. But if you really do a, a detailed test, this, the papers that are designed for sublimation, I think, uh, work considerably better. But hey, do what you think best. Um, so at any rate, the the best general purpose paper is our 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 house paper, which we call the Ditrans SPP, and it is available in a tremendous amount of sizes here. And I don't see the the um, the the web page that was but if you go to the Ditrans website in the search just type in SPP Sam Paul Paul and you'll see all the different sizes we cut um, and of course one of those is the eight and a half by 21 which is just really big and great for for maximizing the the smaller printers um, but you'll also see all the other sizes there that are really great for efficiency. I'm left-handed, so I don't want to cut paper. Um, and, uh, of course, wasting money by buying a paper that you're not using all of it um, is, is not so good. So, so using a mug paper, using paper for the um, little camp mugs, things like that, is, of course, very helpful. Um, so what was the question again? I'm trying to remember. Um, um, so, um, uh, continuing on here, so if you have a smaller printer, uh, then, then using those bigger papers should do it. Um, we already talked about press lines. What else do you see there? Bo? Uh, I know we have question in, on your sheet there about bottle openers and the stainless steel ones. And we have another one here on our Facebook. So they're just kind of wondering how to get the colors to become more vibrant. Craig on Facebook wonders if you can spray paint it white. So um, the bottle openers are, of course, silver. And silver is really sort of gray. And so sublimation sort of assumes we're, we're starting with white, going to black. That's, that's the nature of sublimation. So that's why we can't really sublimate on something that's black because it's already, we'll call it fully sublimated. So when you're when you're doing your designs for for products that are silver, you definitely want to take into account that on those you need to be using very bold colors. Um, and one of the ways to do the best job with bold colors is to print a color chart. Um, on something silver, and we have, of course, um, uh, silver metals, things like that, so you can see what the colors are going to look like before you, you press them. 
Um, one of the color charts that I like that's available in PartnerNet is just our RGB chart. Uh, it's taken from Corel, and it's just your, your, your color chart to find that pleasing color. So it has your primaries, um, has lots of great colors, it has some blacks and grayscales. So that's really the way to, to dial in um, your designs, is to pick colors from a color chart instead of uh, picking them from your monitor. Now, when you do press things like a bottle opener, um, one of the things you can do is, is save the sp spent transfer and look at it and see if uh, most of the ink is gone. Um, and so, really good test to do that is to print an RGB 000, which is black, and then press that. And that's going to let you know um, the best you can get on that substrate. And that's going to be the best. Black is the last color to sublimate. And so that helps you dial in um, what your transfer time needs to be. Typically, if you overcook black, you're going to get brown. It's going to turn a brownish tint. And if you undercook it, you're going to get sort of a, a foggy gray. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's sort of where you're looking at. Now, um, one of the tips that I think um, was in the in the sort of the pre-submitted question was was dealing with uh, moisture, and moisture can cause considerable problems uh, when you're doing these these prints. One of the tips that I think everybody needs to get in the habit of doing is to dry their transfer before they press it. Now that may seem silly to folks, but it's not. It's not silly at all, because after all, you're printing with colored water. Um, and so, even if you leave out your transfer, that's no guarantee that it's going to be dry because um, paper is hydroscopic. It's going to absorb moisture, and really, you want a dry transfer. So, put it in your press, face up, without closing your press for say 10 seconds and just let it dry. Um, and then um, that's going to really help with ensuring that you're doing a good job of transferring because if you have moisture left in there, what's going to happen is that moisture is going to turn into steam and it's going to carry the ink with it. And you're going to get uh, a mini explosion of, of that ink jetting out. So we need to make sure that that uh, the transfer is dry and that's going to help you. But going back to the original question about getting the best job, I would start with black. I would verify my transfer technique by just transferring black onto a piece of metal like the bottle opener, maybe doing a small portion of it, a strip of it, like we mentioned earlier, dialing in our substrate. And then after you got it dialed in, document um, what, what you did um, and you'll, you'll, you'll master it. And then using color charts is the way you're going to find the best bold colors to design with. Um, on a gray substrate, you know, like, like a silver piece of metal, a photograph probably is not going to get the job done. Um, but, but strong, powerful vector colors will. Um, I saw just so many questions running by. Um, what's, one, a, what's good for sublimating on cotton? Uh, well, get to the Did question you? for that. So they're talking about oh. Corel Draw Essentials will work for sublimation. So it's sort of a yes/no. Um, personally, I would tell you to um, to pass and, and not do it. Um, go with the the real version of Corel. The real version of Corel has color management. The Essentials does not. Color management is obviously very important. So I, I would say 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 no. If you did already own Essentials, well, you can try it. So the color charts are available in the PartnerNet support area. That's where they're there. there. So there's a bunch of color charts. Um, the ones that I use on a daily basis are the RGB chart. That's where I'm looking for a pleasing color. And I wish I had an example here. And then number two is the Pantone Go chart. This is one page from that chart. Um, the Pantone Go chart um, is your, your go-to for, for nailing a, 
uh, a spot color. In other words, you're trying to match an exact color, like the color of a shirt, color of a jersey from a school. Um, you're trying to match a what we refer to as a Pantone solid coated color. So if you're trying to match a Pantone solid coated cover, you definitely need to buy yourself a Pantone book. You cannot play the Pantone game without a Pantone good book. So um, very important to use color charts. Um, I don't know why people tend to believe that they can use their monitor to find the color that their client is looking for. It does not work. Um, color charts are a dream come true. They work every time uh, unless your system goes crazy and you know it, it that's that's a good warning that you've got a problem when they don't work. But um, and then the third chart that I use is a red chart. I worked with Corel to um, to get that done. The the red one is there. Um, and it's also included with with all modern versions of Corel. And people, I think, the most problematic color that people have is, is certainly getting the the um, the um, right uh, red. Somebody asked about a Pantone book. Uh, Pantone books are traditionally available um, at an art supply store. Um, I bought mine, I think, off Amazon. Um, the books have to be rebought every couple of years because um, obviously Pantone makes changes to Pantone solid standard. They add more colors. Um, number two is Pantone claims that the colors ultimately become inaccurate after so many years. Um, they have also got a nifty thing in the back of the book about viewing light conditions. So if you don't have good lighting, then your colors that you're looking at right in front of you, 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 you won't see the right color. Um, you know, it's sort of like having daylight lights. In this room, uh, we do have um, daylight bulbs in it, and so that's what makes it good. But in the back of the Pantone, they got a little nifty little um, color strip that that lets you know whether your lighting is appropriate for viewing the book in the first place because again if you're trying to match a color in the book by holding it against the chart um, you've got to have appropriate lighting or or your results just simply won't work um, so um, gotcha um, let's see got so many darn questions uh, love them love them um, um, got a question here about a um, lady indicates she's pressing some Unisub hardboard coasters and she's getting a grease film on them after they sub. I'm guessing she's probably using Pro Spray, but I'm not sure why they would be, be greasy. But if you have um, some residue from Pro Spray or just something on it for some reason that's, that's uh Res residual on it, um, you go to your your denatured alcohol. Um, denatured alcohol does just a great job of wiping all that away. Um, so um, easy works very well. I would absolutely wait till it cools. Um, never play with stuff while it's hot. Um, here's a question about um, ink, and so now there are different inks available for especially for the sawgrass printers and um, so the people ask which one and really there are three the Sublejet, Sublejet UHD, the Easy Subly and then the Chromoblast. Um, so in general the two Chromoblast is not for sublimation we'll come back to it but the two for, for sublimation are the Easy Subly and the Sublejet UHD or Sublejet HD. And you want to go with the Sublejet, um, absolutely for sure. Um, and it has better support, better profiles, all around better, and so that's the one to go with. Um, the the uh, Easy Subly, um, I've just not had good results with. I just don't care for it, so Sublejet UHD with the new printers is, is what you want to go with. Um, talk going back to to what what the best paper to use. 
Um, I think all three of the sublimation papers that are for desktop, um, they work well. Again, I like the die trans paper. The Beaver text print papers are also excellent. Uh, Beaver has recently gone through a name change, which I don't care for at all. And now they have their, their text print um, light and their text print heavy. I think technically it's text print DT, light and heavy. Uh, the heavy version is for Sawgrass Rico printers. <clears throat> the light is for Epson printers. is on the back of the paper they just say text print DT and they don't mention whether it's heavy or light and so you determine it according to the color which I can't remember right this very second but it's a different color but your packaging when you get it will say whether it's heavy or light um, heavy for the the Rico based gel printers sawgrass and then the light for Epson um, so the text print is great paper. The third contender is the Jet Cole DH. It's three initials. Um, I apologize. Um, DTS or something like that. Um, I helped develop that paper with the the Koldenhof folks in the Netherlands. I think it's a good paper. Um, it is a relatively new paper, and so um, but seems to be a good paper. Uh, I think the support in the Sawgrass Print Manager um, is, is pretty good, um, but still a little bit um, on the, the up and coming papers. So the two main papers of the Ditrans SPP and the, the text print, light and heavy. Um, let's see. Okay, talking about uh, butcher paper, yes, um, you need to use uncoated white butcher paper on on everything, top and bottom, um, with with one exception. Um, well, two exceptions. One is some substrates in our instructions will call for Teflon on the bottom, and that's just probably about four things. Um, number two is talking about um, the uncoated white butcher paper on the top. So when we're pressing to substrates that we know have a lot of moisture in them, uh, things like Chromalux and, and the Unisub products, what I do is instead of using the, the cover paper, the, the white uncoated butcher paper, we use fabric on top. The fabric we want to use and it's important to use the right fabric. The fabric we want to use is our polypoplin. Um, and you can buy it on the website. It's almost free. But uh, this is a piece of polypoplin. And we use this right on top of the transfer. And I know it freaks out people. And you can see where this piece of paper has a lot of, you know, a lot of ink on it. This ink will not interfere with with your sublimation. Um, it, it won't bother your substrate, it won't mess up your substrate. You put it on top. And what happens is as moisture is turning into steam because of heat, it's going to rise. It's going to try to escape. And what the fabric does is it acts as an uncompressible vent to allow that moisture to move away from the transfer, to escape. Um, instead of puddling in a particular place. And so some of these questions are related to moisture issues because if you're doing things and you got a lot of moisture, you know you have a lot of moisture because you open the press and you see a plume of moisture, you got to do something about it. And the uh, first step I've already talked about is to dry the transfer. Very important. Um, and so let me say it again. Dry the darn transfer. Uh, number two is if you're dealing with substrates that traditionally put out a lot of moisture, like the ultra-thick um, Unisub and Chromalux um, uh, sub, uh, coatings, that's where the, the fabric really does its job. And it does a fantastic job. Um, and so you want to put fabric on top instead of cover paper, instead of the uncoated white butcher paper. 
Um, make sure that your transfer covers every part of the substrate, um, and that should be your general rule. Then put your, your fabric on there, and when you press, that moisture is going to really have a place to escape. Now some substrates, you know, you do need to pre-press, but we, we try to avoid pre-pressing when we can because it's an extra step and you've got to uh, let it cool before you put the transfer. So um, uh, just read the instructions. Generally, uh, we'll tell you what to do. Now for small items, um, typically you don't need to do much um, on the way of dealing with moisture. But as you've got a bigger piece you're pressing, that's when that fabric on top is, is so important. And that again is poly poplin fabric. Um, so I uh, see somebody um, talking about they ordered their printer and they ordered it with the Easy Subly ink. And yes, you can, you can, um, you can flush and reload the, the ink with the Subljet UHD. Sawgrass, if you ask them, um, they're going to put up a lot of red flags and say, no, you shouldn't do that, you can't. Um, they're even going to throw probably some, some warranty concerns at you. But there have been a lot of people who have done it now that have changed over, and I've never heard of a case that is, is problematic. Yes, we can assist you with that. So if you do have a printer that has the easy sublinks and you want to change over, buy yourself a new waste ink tank because you're going to fill up your old one. Buy you a set of cartridges and we can walk you through the process. If I had a printer with easy subly inks, keep going here. Um, let's see. Um, I'm having banding issues on my printer. Um, so um, love to know which printer you have that would help with um, with uh, talking to you. I but have a, <clears throat> have a sawgrass printer. So yeah, um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> um, no, you cannot use the fabric that is for sublimating for shirts. You need to use thin um, uh, polypoplin. So. Um, Let's talk about banding issues. Um, he has the SG500. Okay, so so typically um, banding issues occasionally can come from how the printer's hooked up. So when you're hooking your printer up, um, never use uh, what's called an external USB hub. Always connect the printer directly from your computer to your printer. Hubs interfere with uh, data flow uh, for printers. Uh, another thing is just verify you have adequate RAM um, and, and that your computer's running you know as fast as it can. Uh, if, the, if the PC can't send data fast enough to the printer, um, then the printer can stop and start. So um, uh, check some of those. Ultimately, give me a call. Um, you know, and I'll do my best. My extension here is 202. So um, we, we usually can, can dissect these issues and try to figure out um, why uh, uh, there's a persistent issue. Um, so um, just skipping around here, talking about ICC profiles for sawgrass printers. So for the, the older printers, the 3110, 7100, 400, 800, we do have ICC profiles for that and we can help you if you either bought your printer from us or you're buying your inks from us. For the new printers, the 500 and 1000, the ICC profiles now are built into the Sawgrass Print Manager. And on that, on the Sawgrass Print Manager, um, it, it took me probably a full year to working with Sawgrass to really embrace the Sawgrass Print Manager. And there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one is that um, I worked with Sawgrass to develop our own Condi version of the Sawgrass Print Manager. And that's a custom edition. Our tech support can help you enable that customization. Um, one of the things that I would do if I was using the Condi version of the uh, Sawgrass Print Manager, which is what I recommend, um, I would go in and probably print 
um, everything using one setup. Um, and so if you go into the Sawgrass Print Manager, you're going to see where you got lots of substrates, lots of this, lots of that. Uh, what I would do um, is I would, um, I would not change those. Um, I would set them and keep them that way across the board. And so what I would do is go in there and choose as your substrate, the, the substrate, choose Chromalux. And then on your print quality, I would choose Advanced Photo. And I would keep it that way across the board. The die trans paper is, say, really what I like are the text print. Those are your two, two great papers to use. Um, and I would, I would not change my settings. Now, I know that may not make sense to people, and they may have their misgivings. But I'm telling you, that's what I do. And, and that's a really good way to, to be consistent with, with one exception. And that is if you use the Easy Subly Vinyl or use the um, uh, Forever um, Cotton products, um, you'll need to choose those products because they're, they're obviously very different substrates. But for your normal kinds of substrates, um, whether it be subluslate, um, whether it be Chromalux, Unisub, um, Fabric, whatever, I really like like those settings. Um, I've done a lot of testing. But, you know, again, there's no sublimation police. You do what works for you. And once you figure out what's worked for you, document it so that you can keep doing it. Um, Let's see, sometimes... Um, hey, Dave, we've got a question here on Facebook. Okay. About the, uh, this time it's, it's Nomex, right? Right. Sorry. So they want to know, is Nomex felt, what is Nomex felt, and is it necessary? So, so our, our instructions are going to call out to you what we recommend. Um, but Nomex is a product that, that we always put on the bottom if we're going to use it. And what it does is it provides a nice cradle for products to move a little bit in here as you're pressing them. So some people do use it for slate. Um, it's very helpful, for instance, for the porcelain Christmas ornaments, which if you put too much pressure, they're going to break. So, so the Nomex is, is there to be placed on the bottom. It's there for products that are generally uh, breakable. Could be a ceramic tile. Um, could be uh, porcelain ornaments, could be something that would, would benefit from rocking a little bit so that it's going to be as level as it can when the bottom, uh, when the top platen comes down uh, like slate. So that, that's what we use it for. Um, and when you need it, you need it. So when people are doing sublimation, I think you really just ought to go ahead as much as possible, buy the standard accessories like heat tape, pro spray, um, vapor foam kit, um, Nomex, green pad, um, just just get those standard accessories. Um, I think I saw something about um, pressing with, you know, using some of the sprays for cotton. Um, I don't like those. I don't really believe in them. Um, again, if they work for you, great. Uh, but what you're really doing is you're spraying a, um, a layer of polyester onto the shirt. Um, I think that's spending a, a whole lot of time, um, you know, when, when really just go ahead and use, um, use a polyester shirt or, or whatever. Now, some of these papers that are on the market today, like the, the Forever Subla Light, Subla Dark, uh, those papers are, are certainly a good start to decorating cotton. Um, they're going to be need, need to use with uh, bold graphics. They're not going to work, for instance, with um, photographs. And I think it's one of those kind of, it's, an, it's sort of an early adopter kind of papers. Um, and, um, you know, again, they're, they're not the easiest papers to use. Um, you have to follow the instructions. You really have to to work at it, but they do work. Um, I do recommend you try them, but, but these kind of papers are, are not the kind of papers that new people should start off with. Um, I think if you're new to sublimation, 
master, uh, for instance, pressing to polyester fabric, build up from there. But when you reach a point where, where really you've mastered um, the basics, you can decide um, to try them. Again, they're, they're certainly advanced. They require um, more paying attention. They certainly require paying attention to the instructions. I mean, really, you can be very sloppy in sublimation and still get good results with, with a lot of substrates. Um, talking about, I think, uh, open house, um, obviously our open house for this year is already cast um, and uh, we're hoping things continue to uh, sort of quote quote get back to normal and so um, I suspect that that next year we'll be be back to it. I sort of enjoy the virtual events because we can do more, we can have more classes. I'm big into education. Um, that That's what I live for is to help people um, get educated and one of my best education tips is that is to document. So I've got my book down here under the table. I just put it out of the way and you want to write everything down. Write down um, your questions, your successes, your failures and very often um, that will be the best way for you to figure out what's wrong. Um, but in any regard if you're documenting it you're going to be in a better position when you call our tech support um, to to ask questions, you've got it written down. So so documenting um, what's going on, creating your wall of shame is is um, if you check out my books, um, that's in the book, um, and you know a lot of resources to help. Uh, let's see. Um, so David, if someone's using Corel Draw, do they still have to use Creative Studio to print? So, um, great question, uh, Bo, and, and this is going really well, and let's see where we are time-wise, uh, 4 o'clock, so we've gone full hour. So, um, that is one of the misconceptions I think people have when they buy a sawgrass printer. I think they're, they're we'll call it a little bit brainwashed into believing that they need to use Creative Studio, and the answer is no. Um, you, you don't need to use Creative Studio. Um, you can use all your traditional applications in print. Um, and as I say, I like the Sawgrass Print Manager because it gives us a print preview that would allow us to gang up jobs in the Sawgrass Print Manager. It allows us to double check our paper settings, um, to check our substrate and all that. So I really like it. Um, use it. Um, Creative Studio is really designed for people that either don't own real software like Corel or Silhouette or Photoshop or Illustrator or if they do own it they don't know how to use it um, and so there's no use in if trying to say you can use um, Corel you know even if you own it if you don't know how to use it um, so people like Roger Wambach teach for us uh, and one of the great resources out there to learn um, will be in person this year and that is the Sublimation Summit. So um, that is perhaps the ultimate um, in-person uh, event this year for that's just the education event. So check out Sublimation Summit. I think it's at the end of September moving into October but it's sort of three and a half days of just tremendous education. But if, if, if you have a sawgrass printer then obviously you can use Creative Studio and so one of the things you could do with Creative Studio is you've got your designs that maybe you've created in in Corel or whatever you could certainly import them in there um, marry them with some of the 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 Creative Studio clip art that would be sort of you know the the only thing I could think of the reason you want to or you want to use some of the e-commerce features that are built into the the Sawgrass environment. They have their Go Exchange and Go Expressions, so that you can sort of sell your stuff online and do that. Um, so that's sort of a, a thing that is um, becoming bigger and bigger in the in the Sawgrass world is um, pushing your stuff online or pushing your stuff to be fulfilled by others in the environment. Um, so 
it's a little bit of an advanced topic, so um, probably we'll have some classes for our um, open house on that. Um, does any software come from the F5, F570? Um, it comes with um, really two pieces of software for printing, and that is the um, Edge Print and then the, the Epson driver. Edge Print is, is basically a uh, rip that you can use with the 570, but it doesn't come with design software. Um, Affinity Designer, Designer, I've not used that very often. I've used it a couple of times, and I've heard good things about it. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was, um, before we run out of time, is our ink minder plate. The ink minder plates are free. Um, you can put them on your printer, and basically what they do is they allow you with a dry erase marker to write in the used by date of your cartridge so that it's sort of in your face. Um, if, you're get, if your ink gets out of date, um, then you can have some color shifts. Um, ultimately, if ink is enough out of date, it can, it can damage the printhead. Um, this plate could be um, obviously used with any printer, but primarily I made it for the Ricoh and Sawgrass printers. I even put the little QR code to help you um, easily reorder ink, sort of like the, the way people do it on Amazon, pretty cute. But they're free, and so if you want to buy one, because they're free, you can just put it in your cart. When you go to our website, um, just type in the search, you type in ink minder. I don't know if that's one or two words, um, but strongly recommend that if you've got a sawgrass printer, put it on there. If you buy the printer from us, you're going to get one in your little welcome kit. Um, let's see real quick and then we will close and we will obviously have to do this again because we we got tremendous amount um, do, do, do. we're just running out of time I'm afraid any uh, last let's see David, last. how long can you quickly answer how long does the ink last so in in the cartridge the sawgrass inks last a long time generally about two years. Um, Epson inks um, generally do not last that long simply because they're exposed to air. Um, and so that's one of the challenges of, of a bulk ink system is you have to vent the ink so that when you pull the ink out of the fixed container, um, air replaces the space that the ink was, just sort of the laws of physics. And so you're oxidizing the ink where with a closed cartridge system, um, you're, you're able to not expose the ink. Um, you know, some people will say, well, I'm going to go with bulk ink because it's less expensive. Um, and, and that, of course, makes a little bit of sense on the surface. The challenge is, um, if you don't, in a bulk ink system, it's been my experience with all the printers we have here, which we have a lot of printers, that that ink is going to start going bad after six months in a bulk ink system. Um, you certainly need to agitate the ink, and that's another problem, um, but do what you think. Um, another thing that people get confused on, because everybody is cost conscious, and I certainly can appreciate that, is that the ink that you're using with your sawgrass system, it's a gel ink. It's a very thick ink, um, and that goes with the Rico uh, Piezo printheads. So one milliliter of, of Sawgrass Rico ink is the same as three milliliters of Epson ink. So the, the Sawgrass inks are highly efficient. And so that bridges the gap a little bit um, on that. Going to the F570, do I like the F570? I do. Um, it's a great printer. The challenge with the F570 is that Epson is simply not making enough of those printers. Um, they have severe supply chain issues, and that really is across the board on all its F-series printers. And so, um, also, people think that, you know, you're saving money on, on when you buy an F570 on ink. Well, guess what? If you just sort of do just a little bit of the math, what Epson has done, and I'm just I I I just talk about how things really are, you know. I'm I'm just gonna 
try to import the knowledge to you. What our friends at Epson have done is they simply added what you would have paid for the ink to the purchase price of the printer. And so they probably have an extra $1,000 on the purchase price of the printer so that your inks appear to be very low cost. Um, and so you're going to pay for, for ink whichever way you go. Um, obviously, if you can take advantage of a bigger heat press, the F570 is the way to go. You know, if you're going to buy you a bigger printer or you intend to just print a boatload of stuff every day, F570 is a bargain. But I can tell you with the Sawgrass printers, um, you're going to get um, just a really good print system, really good software, and you're going to get um, tremendous support um, from, from us and from Sawgrass. Um, Epson, we're going to give you great support, of course, if you buy the printer from us. Um, but Epson is more into, you know, does it print as opposed to helping you with your sublimation issues. So both are great printers to buy, um, and you just pick which one you think would, would best serve you. If you don't know which one, call us and we'll be glad to walk you through sort of a decision tree of which one. Um, but Epson is sort of making it difficult on us now because of the availability of, of their printers. Uh, do you recommend tacky paper or spray? Spray absolutely. Uh, spray is the way that you're going to hold that, that transfer to the substrate when you put it in your press and then that spray is going to hold it uh, when you open your press when air rushes in. Tack papers are, are great for the roll-based printers. Um, we've had a hit and miss success with using the, the tack papers in the 570, but on the bigger printers, certainly um, uh, they're good. I had one question real quick, and then we'll finish up, is um, people were pressing stuff like a hard substrate, like a plaque, and they, they were, were not doing such a good job. So one of the tips is to do a, a sneak peek, and you'll see Sprite do this all the time, where you tape three sides, but you leave one side as your peak side, and that allows you to peek it um, and see if it's really done. Um, you really can't, you know, uh, take the transfer off and put it back on for a second pressing. It's just not going to work. But, but you can peek at it. And, and certainly that's a good a good way. Sometimes people will hold their finger in the middle of the transfer, like for a soft substrate, and peek at it, and you can get away with that. Um, so um, how do you get the spray off your fingers? Again, denatured alcohol is, to me, me a good way to do it. Well, I want to wrap up because I know people have been with us, and I do appreciate everybody. We will do this again, so send us more questions and we will answer them. I want to thank everybody for being part of this. And um, um, just as a final comment, uh, we've got a great May coupon going on. It's uh, $25 off an order of $200 or more. Coupon code is CPN, which is Charlie Paul Newman hyphen May Save. Uh, one word, May Save, M-A-Y-S-A-V-E. Um, I think it's good to the end of the month, and I um, want to wish everybody a great weekend. Thanks for being with us. Till we meet again.